It is difficult to imagine the Philippine educational landscape without the private schools. The private schools help the state fulfill its mandate of making quality education accessible to all Filipinos. It is in recognition of this role that the Fund for Assistance to Private Education, a permanent trust fund for private education, was established through Executive Order 156 on November 5, 1968. The Private Education Assistance Committee, or the PEAC, was created as the trustee of the fund. The PEAC is composed of the Secretary of Education as the ex officio chair and a representative each from the National Economic Development Authority, Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines, Philippine Association of Colleges and Universities, and Association of Christian Schools, Colleges, and Universities. For the development of private education, the PEAC takes on the role of funder, advocate, partner, and enabler. A national secretariat headed by an executive director executes the policies, programs, and initiatives of the PEAC for private education. In 1989, a landmark piece of legislation, RA 6728, or the Government Assistance to Students and Teachers in Private Education or GASPE, was passed. The GASPE Act, which was amended by RA 8545, in 1998, institutionalized government assistance to private education in the country. The Educational Service Contracting, or ESC, Teacher Salary Subsidy, or TSS, Senior High School Voucher Program, the In-Service Training, or INSET, and Research, are part of the Department of Education's GASPEP program. The PEAC implements the GASPER program given the track record of the PEAC in program management. The PEAC has been involved in the development of the ESC from piloting a scheme, which was a precursor to the ESC in 1982 to 1986, to implementing the ESC in 1986 to 1991, and from 1996 up to the present. The ESC today has close to a million beneficiaries. Part of the PEAC infrastructure for the GASPER program is the Regional Secretariat. The PEAC RS is headed by the Regional Program Director who designates a Regional Program Coordinator for the day-to-day -day program implementation in the region. The PEAC has the following responsibilities in the GASPER program. Orientation. ESC certification, SHS voucher applications, processing, monitoring, resolving cases of schools with adverse findings, regular meetings and consultations with stakeholders, research and data gathering, in-service training. The PEAC is also accredited as a local continuing professional development or CPD provider by the Professional Regulation Commission, or PRC. Participants of the INSET programs offered by the PEAC have the opportunity to earn the required CPD units for the renewal of their professional licenses. From 2012 to 2017, the PEAC trained a total of more than 70,000 junior high school teachers and since 2016, an estimated 17,000 SHS teachers. The PEAC also implements its own programs of assistance. The Assistance to Programs and Initiatives to Reform Education, or ASPIRE, gave funding support in the amount of $33.7 million to 99 projects of private educational associations since 2015 to 2016. The research for school improvement towards excellence has assisted 79 private school administrators and teachers writing their theses and dissertation since 2015 to 2016. The Dissemination Assistance to Research and Education, or DARE, has supported 16 faculty members who presented their papers in international conferences abroad since it was launched in 2016 to 2017. The Philippine Education Research Journal is an online resource for decision makers, policy makers, and practitioners in education. 
Its editorial board consists of highly respected educators and researchers. The Philippine Education Conference is an opportunity for school administrators and teachers to learn from educational leaders and experts here and abroad as they discuss educational issues, concerns, trends, and innovations. Recognizing the inherent strengths of the private schools in achieving excellence in Philippine education, the PEAC is committed to promoting private education as an integral part of our educational system. Brothers and sisters, let us call on the Almighty and ask for his blessing. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of love, be in our hearts and minds as we gather to pray for our country and for the world. We come today as a people created in your image and likeness, as a free nation whose rights and dignity come with being your children and grateful for these gifts, hopeful for a future when common good is a pursuit and human rights are embedded in cultures and traditions. Aware that all of us, regardless of religion, language and tradition, are interconnected in the web of life, we pray for everyone's protection against political agenda, structures and schemes that are designed to curtail human progress. God of mercy, we lift up to you those entrusted with the care of people. Grant them your grace to purify their intentions and the wisdom to learn to pursue only that which is one, true, good, and beautiful. Let them be the good we want to see in our leaders. Let them have the truth you want them to possess, that they may become the leaders you want them to be, faithful to their mission and committed to the real meaning of common good. Together, may we build a society rooted in your name for your glory and honor. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
fellow human rights advocates, educators across the country, maayong hapon. Human rights indeed has never been on the spotlight as much as it does now. The last time discussion on human rights was heavy was during the dark years of the martial law and human rights violation has been consistently manifest, especially in the lower echelon of society. My father was murdered three years ago in an attempt to silence people who fight for the rights of poor farmers. Pope Francis, in his latest encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, expresses his vision of an open world. He teaches how a person's life should be measured by love. He emphasizes how everyone is called to seek better for the life of the other, far from all selfishness. The right to live with dignity, after all, belongs to everyone. No exclusion. Leader to series of the Private Education Assistance Committee seeks to educate for social transformation in the 21st century. Pope Francis, during the Global Compact for Education, held virtually and in Rome last October, sees transformative education as a hope that can shatter the determination and fatalism that the selfishness of the strong, the conformism of the weak, and the ideology of the utopians as the only way forward. On behalf of all the private educational institutions in the country, I thank PEAC for leading in the discussion on human rights agenda. The effort is what Pope Francis calls the co-responsibility in creating and putting into place new processes and changes to take an active part in renewing and supporting our troubled societies. Congratulations to the organizers. Take part everyone in the discussion, but above all, be active in the defense of human rights. God bless us all. Thank you, uh, Father Iking Balonga, for the leading the interfaith prayer and uh, for the opening uh, remarks. Uh, Father Iking Balonga is the Vice President of the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines and the Superintendent of the Diocese of Dumaguete. We also would like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Arman Ferrer for his rendition of the Philippine National Anthem. Arman is a musical uh, theater artist, uh, best uh, known for his role as Emilio Aguinaldo in the play Babining Mandirigma of Tanghalang Pilipino. We'd like to welcome all of you to Leader 2, but to, uh, for us to recall, uh, indeed in July of this year, PAC started Leadership, Innovation, and Dynamism Towards Educational Reforms, or DEDER. In July, we had five um, well-respected members of academe who discussed various topics which are crucial to schools, especially in navigating COVID-19. But this is not exactly a reactive response on the part of PAC, but rather proactive in our initiative to ensure that schools are future-proofed, that we have uncompromising quality towards a better normal, that we have fiscal discipline in the time of COVID, and that we continue the work of educating the conscience. Thus, Leader 2, uh, which starts today, actually evolves on the theme, Educating for Social Transformation in the 21st Century. The work of transforming society continues, as emphasized by uh, Father Eking, and educational institutions are in a good position to become seedbeds of social transformation. However, they must reimagine their roles 
and adopt their approaches to this transformative power based on the context they find themselves in. So with this afternoon, we start with leader two, and we are extremely privileged to have invited uh, three uh, well-respected members of academe. For this afternoon, we start with Attorney Chel Diokno. Tomorrow, we will have uh, John Neri from Atene de Manila University. And on Friday, we, should have, we will be having Professor Christian Esguera from the University of Santo Tomas. Our speaker for this afternoon needs very little introduction, but I'd like to um, read a little now of uh, what uh, is most significant about the work of Dean Jose Manuel Diocno, founding dean of the De La Salle University College of Law and chair of the Free Legal Assistance Group. He has been practicing law for 30 years and gained prominence as a human rights lawyer and litigator. The De La Salle University College of Law, which opened in 2010, is the first law school in the Philippines to highlight human rights and legal aid as part of its educational program, while the Free Legal Assistance Group is the oldest organization of human rights lawyers in the Philippines, known for handling cases involving civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. Though already well known in legal and human rights circles, Dean Chell gained wider public prominence when he ran on a platform of justice and judicial reform during the 2019 senatorial elections. He emerged as one of the leading opposition senatorial candidates, largely because of his connection with young voters who made sure he consistently topped nearly all pre-election surveys in schools and universities all over the country. Though he actually has no grandchildren yet, these young Filipinos adopted Dean Shell as their woke lolo during the campaign because of his progressive stance on issues, his advocacy for youth empowerment, and his witty remarks despite the occasional dad joke. Even with the elections over, Dean Shell continues to engage with his children or children by serving as speaker for various events for numerous schools and organizations all over the country. We are very, very happy to have Attorney Chell Diokno this afternoon so that we may have genuine conversations on human rights and that these conversations are not reduced to messy political noise. We'd like to answer the questions, how do we protect and promote human rights as educators? And why should and how can educational institutions embrace the human rights agenda? Kinakagala kong ipakilala sa inyo, si Attorney or Dean Chell Diokno. Thank you, uh, Doris, uh, <clears throat> Father Iking, and of course, the Private Education Assistance Committee for this opportunity to talk about something that is really very close to my heart, and that is human rights. I, I am very privileged to have had a front seat in the birth of human rights in our country. And I have also had the privilege of working with a lot of human rights defenders in the Philippines. That's why whenever I have an opportunity like this to speak, especially to educators about human rights, I, I really take advantage of that opportunity. Um, let me tell you first a little bit about how human rights became a byword in our country. Of course, the concept of human rights first emerged after the Second World War when the United Nations was created and came together and, and, and promulgated the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So we have now gone past 100 years of having that concept of human rights in the international community. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was followed by other instruments that became multilateral treaties like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and many other human rights instruments that focus on various vulnerable sectors like women, children, migrant workers, and so forth. But in the Philippines, human rights never really caught on until probably about 30 years ago. 
Human rights was not a concept when martial law was declared by Ferdinand Marcos in 1972. Although among the legal circles, pinag-uusapan namin yan, it was not uh, really accepted among the people. Hindi pa pinag-uusapan talaga yan. And of course, I, we all know what happened during martial law when um, so many what later became called human rights violations took place. But let me tell you a story about myself because this is also a story about human rights. And it is a story about how martial law, in a sense, gave birth to human rights. I was 11 years old when martial law was declared and 25 years old when the Marcoses left the Malacanang. So I can say that I, was, uh, I am a child of martial law. My life, my entire reality was shattered on September 22, 1972, when soldiers came to our house, knocked on our door, and took my father away without any warrant of arrest, without any criminal case being filed against him, and really without any reason for him to be taken away from us. I still very distinctly remember seeing his back, seeing him being led away from our house by soldiers armed with the M16s, uh, many of them, and putting them in a military car. And I remember thinking that what's going to happen to my father and when will I ever get to see him again? And that was my awakening as a Filipino. That was my first brush with injustice coming from a government. And of course, that really opened my eyes to what was really happening in our country. At that time, my father was a senator. At that time, he was a highly respected lawyer. He was known to be a statesman. He had been uh, recognized as one of the most outstanding senators for the last uh, how many years before he was put in jail. And when he was in jail, he really as well had his own time to reflect. And that time, that opportunity gave him a lot of time to think about what was happening in our country. And one of the things he vowed to himself was that if he ever got out of jail, he would dedicate his life to fighting for it, promoting and upholding human rights. And two years after he was jailed, when he was released by the Marcos regime, he really gave the rest of his life to fighting for our rights. I was then 13 when my dad was released, but um, I already knew I was going to be a lawyer. So whenever he would go to court, I would proudly carry his bag and wear a barong and observe the lawyers um, at that time. And I can say that I learned much more from them than I ever learned in law school. But going back, um, what is this issue of human rights and why is it so important? Well, my father, who is acknowledged to be the father of human rights as well, put it very simply, but I think very elegantly in terms of explaining what human rights is all about. And he said, you know, marami tayong mga karapatan, kuminsan nakakalito pa nga eh, kasi we have so many rights. We have the right to earn a living, we have the right to marry, we have the right to education, we have the right to health, we have um, the right to uh, be free from torture, the right to freedom of speech, and so forth. But he said there's a very easy formula to remember all these rights. Because he said all our rights really stem from three basic concepts, three basic rights. And of course, the very first is the right to life. That is the most basic right because we cannot enjoy any other right unless we are alive. So that right must be respected at all times. After all, that is not something we got ourselves or we acquired ourselves, but rather it is a right that came from our God. It is the right, the life that we have is really not our own. It comes from a higher power. But he said, it is not enough that we live because if we are alive, but we are treated like animals, put in cages, not allowed to speak, not allowed to live the way we want to live, then that is not really a human life. So he said the second right that we have is the right to live 
with dignity. So we have a right to life, we have a right to live with dignity. And third, because when we are born, we are given by our God the talents, the skills, essential things that only came from up above. We have a right to develop those talents, those skills to our full potential. Not just for ourselves, not only for our families, but for our communities and for our country. All our other rights come from these three basic rights. From our right to life, for example, comes the right not to be killed, not to be executed, either by points of death penalty or by extrajudicial killing. From our right to dignity comes our right to not to be tortured, a right to be treated as human beings at all times. From our right to develop comes our right to education, our right to form associations, our right um, to, to really develop ourselves to our full potential. But then we have to realize that aside from being individuals, we all live in one society. We all belong to one community of Filipinos. So just as I have an individual right to life, I have an individual right to dignity, and I have an individual right to develop my talents to their full potential. Collectively, we as a people also have three basic rights. Corresponding to the right to life of an individual is our collective right to survive as a people. That is why our constitution prohibits any kind of nuclear weapons in Philippine territory. Corresponding with our right to dignity as individuals collectively, we have a right to self-determination, meaning that no other country, no one else can tell us how we should develop our country except ourselves. And just as individually, we have a right to develop our, to our full potential. As a people, we also have a right to develop to our full potential. And that is the basis of all other rights that we have both legally and morally. But I guess I should address the question, well, why is it important? So what if I have this right to life, the right to dignity, the right to develop? Well, the short answer I can give you is that if we did not have these human rights, then we could be treated like animals. We could be treated without dignity. We could be treated as if we were not human beings. And if you try to imagine a world without human rights, that is the world we lived in before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where civilians could be killed in an armed conflict, where you could be tortured without accountability, where you could be put in a dog cage, treated like an animal with a chain around your neck, starved, and really treated without any kind of dignity. And that is why human rights are so important because they are human rights are not only what make us human, human rights are what differentiate us or protect us from being treated without dignity. And that is to me, the really most important thing about human rights. Is human rights a Western concept? Actually, I will answer you by saying no, clearly not. As early as the time of Rizal, Bonifacio, Mabini, we already embraced this concept of human rights. And even much earlier than that, if you look at our language, if you look at our history, dignity, human dignity has always been a big part of our struggle. Before we won our independence from Spain, we fought 130 revolts that did not succeed. But why did we keep on fighting when we knew we had an enemy that had superior military force and superior organization? I believe it is because we valued our dignity so much that we could not stomach, we could not accept that we would be slaves or treated like slaves without dignity by a foreign colonial master. And not only during that time did we struggle for our dignity, when the Americans came, despite, again, the military superiority that they had, we fought 
for our independence because we believe that we are entitled to help self-determination. When the Japanese came, we fought for our, our freedom and our, our dignity as well. And even during the Marcos dictatorship, we lost almost an entire generation of some of the best and brightest young people who gave their lives for our freedom and for our human rights. That's why I am really saddened by those who make light of human rights. I, I really feel so bad when I hear people say human rights doesn't mean anything. Wala naman kahalagahan yan. Ang mga human rights defender puro criminal na lang ang dinedepensahan ninyo. Because it betrays, number one, a lack of understanding of our history. And it betrays a lack of understanding of what human rights really means. You know, if not for the few men and women who stood up for our human rights during the early part of martial law, my father was one of them, there were only a few in the beginning, if not for them, I don't think we would ever have Edsel of 1986, and I don't think we would ever be able to enjoy the freedoms and the rights that we have today. So rather than putting them down, rather than demeaning them, I believe we should honor those who fought and continue to fight for our human rights. How can schools and educational institutions embrace the human rights agenda? Well, I think number one, we have to practice what we preach. I believe that we must infuse everything we do as educators with those concepts of human rights, meaning we respect at all times the right to life, we respect at all times the right to dignity, and of course, the right to develop to our full potential. And you know, that is one misconception that I want to address, where a lot of those who are anti-human rights say, oh, you mga human rights defenders, ang, all you do is you, you get these criminals out of jail. And I, I want to correct that misconception. This, we believe, I believe, that when a person commits something wrong, when a person commits a crime, that person should be punished. He should be punished to the full extent of the law, but never compromise his or her dignity. We punish them for the acts that they do, not for the person that they are, because they are, after all, human beings, and they still deserve to be treated like human beings even if they have committed some bad things in their life. Because if we don't do it that way, if we can say, well, you did something wrong and therefore you, we don't have to treat you like a human being, can you imagine how divisive that can be? That is why Hitler was able to convince and, and to, to wage a world war, because he was able to convince his people then that Jews are not human beings and therefore they can be treated like animals. They can be butchered, they can be experimented on, they can be treated with utmost indignity. And that is also the same thing that we hear today. Ay, yung mga pulahan dyan, hindi tao yan. Yung mga addict dyan, hindi tao yan. Kaya pwede nang patayin yan. But if we embrace that kind of thinking, that is the, the most divisive kind of thinking that will just lead to more violence. It can never justify that kind of violence. And that's why to me, it is something that we must begin in, as educators from a very, very young age. I think from the time our students are in basic education all the way until they reach college and beyond, that these concepts of revering life, respecting dignity, and allowing our talents to develop to their full potential, these are concepts that we have to embrace and include not only in our curriculum, not only in our subjects, but also in the way we live, in the way we act, in the way we teach, and in the way we conduct ourselves as educators. You've asked me also, um, another question, how can we ed educators be more systematic in incorporating human rights agenda in our schools programs and activities? Well, I think, first of all, 
I, I don't see any need to teach human rights as a separate subject. I think we can include and incorporate basic concepts of human rights in practically any subject we teach in any grade or year level. It could be mathematics, it could be social science, Aralim Panlipunan, it could be even English, it could be any subject I think can be a good channel to introduce basic concepts of human rights. For example, the, the concept of um, revealing life, right? to me, that is a concept that um, we can put into in, in any particular subject. And I am very proud and happy to say as well that as far as the law schools are concerned, the school of which I was dean, the La Salle College of Law, is the first uh, law school in the country that really based its um, educational mission on human rights and as well on making sure that our lawyers retain the values that they need to become good lawyers, not only for themselves, but for our country. Because after all, when you speak of human rights, really, it is a mirror of what we are all looking for, and that is justice. When there is no human rights, when there is no justice, that is the kind of vacuum that invites violence, that invites authoritarianism, that invites everything that we don't want to happen in our country. And if you think about it, who really needs human rights? Who really needs the law? Who really needs justice? Uh, rich and powerful people don't need it because, because of their riches and their power, they will get the respect that they're looking for. But the people who really need human rights, the people who really need the law, and justice are the poor and the marginalized, those who don't have a voice, those who will not be protected, those who are always vulnerable to abuses and to exploitation. Human rights basically is all about accountability. It's about dignity and if your dignity is violated, then you must be held accountable. But there's another deeper meaning to human rights and that is that it is also about empowerment. Because if I recognize the right to dignity of a worker, of a fisher folk, of an indigenous person, of um, a child, of a woman, when I recognize their rights, I am empowering them. I am recognizing them as human beings, as people. And that is the kind of nation I believe we would all want to have. A nation where even the least of the least even those who have no voice, even those who don't own anything beyond what they are wearing on their bodies, have dignity and will be treated with dignity as human beings. Ayun, that is my, my short um, talk about human rights. I hope that uh, has helped to stimulate everybody about thinking about human rights from a different perspective, a perspective of humanity, and a perspective of this dignity. Thank you and a good day to everyone. Raming salamat, uh, Attorney Chell. Uh, may mga konting katanungan dito, no? Galing sa ating mga, uh, na, mga attendees na nasa Facebook. So I think we have some time for uh, Q&A. But uh, first of all, maraming maraming salamat na sa pagpapaunlak nyo sa imbitasyon ng PAC at uh, uh, nakakatuwa no? yung inyong uh, maikling presentation on human rights because to us, it, 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 it is uh, actually unbelievable that uh, you know, we have violations of human rights and in fact, these are just so basic that being human uh, it's understandably that we should be protective of these rights. No? Um, ang tanong ko dito ay galing sa isang uh, human rights NGO group na, na fortunately kasama natin. No? We want to implement uh, human rights interventions in private and public schools. Uh, we would appreciate your suggestions as we are in the stage of project planning. Do you think these schools are open to human rights education interventions? 
definitely. And I think it's about time that we really do this on a, on a national scale. Actually, in the early 1990s, kung maalala ko, um, my sister, uh, Maris, uh, Dr. Maris Diokno, who's also an educator, had developed several modules for teaching human rights even as early as grade one. And they did it not as a separate subject, but as uh, to be infused in the existing subjects that were being taught at that level. And I recall, umikot pa kami noon eh, umabot pa ako ng Palawan. We met with the public school teachers there uh, talking about human rights and explaining these concepts that I had explained to you. Kaya sa palagay ko lang ay eh, napapanahon na talaga na may pasok natin ito, hindi lang sa mga pampublikong skwelahan, pati sa private schools. This is a, a very complementary subject to a lot of other subjects that we teach. Especially, in, for example, when we teach Philippine history, um, parang hindi nabibigyan ng kahit anong pansin ang karapat ng pantao at paano siya naging uh, konsepto, paano siya natanggap sa ating lipunan. Hindi siya, I have not seen any materials that discuss history from a human rights point of view. Pagdating sa issues ng uh, values education as well, um, human rights is, is a very, very powerful tool for imparting values. Because when, when a child understands that concept of dignity, dadalhin niya yun eh hanggang lumaki na siya. Uh, pero kung hindi niya natanggap at hindi niya na, na, natutunan yung concept ng dignidad nung siya ay maliit, madali siyang maloko pag siya ay lumaki. And in many ways, kaya maraming nadadala dyan sa rhetoric, yung anti-human rights rhetoric, ay dahil palagay ko, hindi natin sila na, na, na hindi natin namulat ang kanilang mata nung sila ay bata pa. Medyo ba uh, disturbing, no? Yung naging sagot ninyo, <laughs> Attorney Chell, no? Tungkol dyan sa... Uh, because w what we see right now, uh, which uh, as we saw in the introduction, no, um, marami kayong children, no? Although marami din kasi ang medyo pumupuna, no? Even when we release the posters on this forum, ang, ang sinasabi nila is nagiging political daw ang PAC sa pagdi-discuss ng human rights. When in fact, sa, aming, sa, sa, sa ating pananaw, parang this is so very basic no? because we are humans and we are in the business no? of forming no? uh, minds and hearts of the young. Parang kailangan talaga kung siguro tap, dapat tawagin na whole school yung approach no? ng human rights education no? para sa ating mga skwelahan. At siguro nga baka may pagkukulang uh, sa aspetong yan. If, if I may add, palagay ko nagsadya na, yan eh, na gawin nilang ipoliticize itong konsepto ng human rights. Kung titignan kasi natin yung ating kasaysayan, pag meron tayo mga uh, may panahon na talagang nagiging mas ang tendency ng governance is to be more controlling, more um, paternalistic, then the tendency is to um, demean human rights. Kasi nga, it is the opposite of a paternalistic type of uh, governance. Pag sinabi kasi natin yung human rights, edi kinikilala natin yung karapatan natin magsalita ng malaya, yung karapatan natin na hindi lang mabuhay, pero mabuhay na may dignidad. At siyempre, sakop ng dignidad yung pwede kang maglabas uh, ng inyong hinaing at sa loobin. And um, that is also, I think, why so, human rights is so important kasi yung konsepto ng human rights ay talagang nakakabit yan sa ating demokrasya. Pagka nawala yung konsepto natin ng human rights, madali nang mawala na rin yung ating demokrasya. Kaya ang, ang target nga ngayon yung freedom of speech eh. because freedom of speech is really one of the foundations of our democracy. Again, no, we come to something that's rather bothersome again, no? Kasi minsan sa isang skwelahan, meron ka scenario na ah, baka hindi din masyadong open ang uh, administrasyon o ang mga guro sa freedom of expression ng kanilang mga estudyante. It can also be very uh, threatening, no? 
for schools to develop in their students a critical mind, a questioning mind. Uh, sa t- uh, and, and to us, makikita natin, counterproductive ito no? sa iniisip natin na kailangang uh, mag- magpahalagahan no? ang, ang karapatan na ito. So yung sinasabi ninyo, you think it was by design that uh, our educational system has uh, not been very deliberate and systematic in incorporating the discussions on human rights? I, I'm not sure I can say that it was by design, but definitely medyo nakalimutan siya. So, hindi natin na ipasok sa ating um, fact, um, formula for education itong konsepto ng human rights. Uh, it's it, Actually, we were already moving, we had moved forward a lot since uh, the 1980s when it came to human rights. For example, by the in the last 10 years, like 2010, 2012, um, pati ang ating Philippine National Police at Armed Forces of the Philippines ay meron na silang human rights office. At kaming mga NGOs na dati kumbaga parang sinasabi nilang kalaban namin ang AFP at PNP. Kami ang nagte-training sa kanila. So we were on very good terms with both our, our police officers and our soldiers because we, as we explained to them, we're on the same side. We are all after one thing and that is a, a, a just and a, a society that, has ju- that is just and has peace. And we were moving forward very, very smoothly. Napakaganda na may mga manual na kami on human rights-based policing, uh, manuals. But one thing that I did not see was a corresponding movement in the educational system. Na parang yun ang nakalimutan. Uh, again, disturbing answer, no? <laughs> Kung sa educational system natin, med- medyo kailangan talagang uh, we move forward no, in this direction. And it seems that there are gaps. Uh, in human rights education, no, implementing it uh, more systematically. Pero hin- ako ang personal na tanong ko lang ito eh. Um, hindi kaya, masasabi ba natin na inherent sa mga Filipinos yung kanilang pag-value ng kanilang dignidad? Kasi minsan, may, may ano ako dun eh, parang, parang hindi ko minsan nakikita. If you will see the pronouncements, if you will see, for example, you know, that uh, they, they allow themselves to be demeaned. At the same time, meron din ba tayong uh, as a Filipino people, may pagpapahalaga ba tayo sa ating uh, right to self-determination? Kasi parang hindi yata ako masyadong sigurado. But kung titignan natin yung, yung ating wika, uh, saan ba nang galing halimbawa yung salita natin para sa hostisya? Ang ginagamit natin di ba, ay katarungan. Ang root word ng katarungan ay tarong. Tarong is actually not a Tagalog word. A Visayan word yan. Pero pag tinignan natin yung ibig sabihin ng tarong, ang ibig sabihin nun, kung ano yung nararapat, kung ano yung tama, kung ano yung appropriate. Tingnan natin naman yung salitang human right. Anong ginagamit natin ay karapatan. Ano ang root word ng karapatan ay dapat. So yung, yung salita natin para sa hostisya at yung salita natin para sa karapatan, ay magkapareho lang ang kahulugan, yung nararapat. So if you look at our history, our, our language, I mean, our language shows that we connect, we see a very close connection between justice and basic rights. Otherwise, we would have not used the same meaning. We would not have given the same meaning to those two uh, different concepts. And then if you look at our history from the time of... Um, the Spanish colonial masters until today, I think you can say, you can see an unbroken line of Filipinos struggling to have dignity. I, I cannot see any other explanation why we would struggle so much and fight more than a hundred revolts against Spain if it were just because we wanted riches, power, in there. It, it had to be something much deeper than that for us to continue to fight despite losing all those revolts and losing a lot of lives in the process. And if you think about it, ako, I, I am sometimes I'm awed by our heroes. 
because they fought and gave their lives for people who weren't who were not even born yet. Wala pa tayo sa mundo noon nung ipinaglalaban na tayo ni Rizal at ni Mabimi at lahat ng mga bayani niyan. Kumbaga, yung vision nila was really a vision for the future. And that's why I tell the young people I encounter today, we can do no less than those who came before us. They fought for this country, for our democracy, and we can do no less but continue to fight for these principles that go beyond... Uh, ano, talagang sa akin, itong konsepto ng human rights is really far, far beyond politics. Kahit sino pa ang nasa, nakaupo sa pwesto, importante pa rin yung dignidad ng tao, importante pa rin yung buhay ng tao. At um, it, I would gauge any administration the same way, whether it is this administration or the previous one or the next one. As far as human rights is concerned, pare-pareho lang naman yung obligasyon nila. At uh, yun ang dapat mapatupan. Hindi nga ako eh. Bakit ang daming, bakit hirap na hirap tayo sa struggle na to? When in fact, ang root word ay dapat. Tarong. Dapat. ba? Diba? Ito yung dapat. Uh, dapat nga, hindi tayo nag argue about it, hindi ba? Because that's a question that asks now about our human rights situation. What are our prospects now in improving the human rights situation in the Philippines? So uh, the question means we're not in a good state. Well, napag-isipa ko rin ng maigi ang tanong na yan eh. Ang, this is where I'm, these are the thoughts I have about that. Um, matagal, na, na, matagal na tayong nawala ng hostisya sa ating bayan. Uh, you go, kahit saan kang pumunta sa sulok ng Pilipinas, magtanong ka ng mga Pilipino, mayroon bang hostisya ang, ang pangkaraniwang tao? And they will say, wala, bakit po sa atin double standard of justice? And I think it has gotten to a point where people um, are so disgusted with the justice system that they want results. And they have reached a point where they don't care if the results will have um, collateral damage. For example, uh, let's make, do, give specific examples. Sa issue la, ng drugs. Sa marami nagsasabi nung nagsimula pa yung war on drugs, oh, mabuti na nga, pinatay na yung mga yan eh. Kasi pag hinuli mo lang yan, alam nila yung laro sa mga korte, makakalusot yan, maglalagay lang yan ng kung ano-anong pera sa judge o sa police o kung kanino man, at uh, makakalusot sila. Ligtas. And so, they are justifying these shortcuts because they want the result. But what and but uh, what people don't realize is that if we are if we really want to have justice in our country there is no shortcut to justice there is no shortcut solution kung gusto natin magkaroon ng katarungan sa Pilipinas wala tayong ibang pwedeng gawin kundi ayusin natin yung ating bulok na sistema ng hustisya hindi solusyon yung magpapatay ka because if you go down through that route kung magpapatay ka O di ngayon, ang papatayin mo ay mga adik Bukas, sabihin natin ay uh, mga sinasabi nilang terorista. Susunod na araw, sasabihin nila yung mga red tag. O di lahat na lang, patayan na. Paano pwede ba mag yun para sa ating lipunan? We want to have justice, we want to have accountability, then we have no choice but to strengthen the justice system. And that is also what human rights is all about. Eh. Kasi pag uh, sa usaping human rights, napakalaking bagay yung pananagutan. Uh, anong pake, what's the use of having the right to life or the, having the right to dignity if it can be violated with impunity? So there have to be mechanisms in a society that will um, prevent people from doing that or if they do it, holding them accountable for, for those wrongs. And that's... Um, the long and the short of it, we, we want these things, then we have to really work for it. Siguro isa na ito sa mga konkretong paraan, no? Para, you know, magkaroon tayo ng ganito mga klaseng conversations, no? Pero ito, may tanong tayo. Uh, natatakot naman daw if ever they conduct efforts and activities no, in support of human rights advocacies dahil baka ma-red tag naman daw sila. <laughs> well, alagay ko naman pag ang Usapin natin ay tungkol sa dignidad ng tao. How can you be red tag for 
upholding the dignity of a person. I, I think the pwede naman natin i, ituro itong mga values ng human rights kahit hindi natin ginagamit yung salitang human rights. Yung um, paggagalang natin, yung pagmamahal natin sa buhay ng tao, hindi naman kailangan sabihin human rights yun. Yung, um, yung pagtrato natin sa isa't isa na may dignidad, hindi naman kailangan sabihin na human rights yun eh. Yung, yung, yung pagkakilala natin na ang lahat ng tao ay may sarili-sariling talento, may sariling regalo na galing sa Diyos na dapat magamit niya hindi lang para sa sarili kundi para sa kanyang komunidad. We also don't need to use the, the word human rights to impart those values. What is important to me is that we impart the values whether we use the words or not. Akin, really doesn't matter. So that's a good point, no? Talagang we impart the values. I suppose we model the values, no? As teachers and educators, school administrators, no? Those who are leading schools. We model the values. And at the same time, we call out, di ba? Kung anong nakikita natin parang mali or talagang mali. No? Kasi sabi nga natin ngayon, no? Yung pagpagrespeto no? sa dignidad ng bawat isa. Lalo na siguro sa social media ngayon. Lahat lagi sinasabi, social media is toxic with uh, comments no that are that uh, are uh, really uh, you know uh, you know uh, so low that hindi hindi kumbaga sa atin parang hindi usapang tao yata ito pag ganyan ang mga comments there is one thing going for us and uh, ito rin na pag-isipan ko rin ng medyo matagal din ito we have a very strong sense of injustice ang Pilipino pag nakakita ng may nangyaring hindi makatarungan, alam natin agad at hindi lang, sa, hindi lang natin nararamdaman sa utak yon. We feel it in our heart and we feel it in our gut. And, and to me, that we can work from there. We can work from there because that is the, the core really of our values of, of uh, revering life and dignity. Kaya yung ibang nag-viral sa lockdown, yung mga naglabag ng curfew tapos nilagay sa kudungan ng aso, Ang bilis nag-viral yon. I think it's because anyone who sees it, we malakas sa atin yung sense of injustice na yun eh. And we can work from there and, and build on that, I believe. Oh, oh that's a positive point. <laughs> that we have a strong sense of injustice. Oh, at sana yun ang maharness natin, no? Para magtulong-tulong tayo towards ensuring that human rights are really respected, no? In, in Philippine society. So, uh, marami pa tayong mga comments. I think uh, maraming uh, talagang natuwa no? dito sa ating uh, one hour na, na webinar na ito. At uh, we would like to ask you kung meron pa kayong gustong sabihin. Ayan at marami tayong mga nanonood ngayon na teachers, mga school officials, may mga tanong dito kung daw ang mga estudyante nagka-clarify ng kanilang mga grades at hindi sila magkasundo. Human rights violation daw ba yun? <laughs> hindi naman. <laughs> yung, yung issues like that, I think, have, in any kind of issue in, in our schools must always be treated with dignity. Ako, nung ako'y lumaki at nag-aaral ng law, nung panahon namin, ang law student, nako, pwede pwedeng mong tratuhin na parang hayop yan ng mga professor ko noon, kung ano-anong pinagmumura kami noon. Tapos sasabihin sa akin, wala kang kwenta. Huwag ka na mag-aral dito. Umalis ka na. Maghanap ka na lang ng um, kung ano man trabaho ang kung kanino ka, kung sino man ang kukuha sa iyo. But I, I have never subscribed to that kind of um, teaching methods. And as far as we are concerned sa, sa College of Law sa Lasal, ayaw na namin yung ganon. Kasi magtuturo ka ng human rights tapos ang trato mo sa estudyante mo walang dignidad eh hindi naman pwede yun so uh, when students come to me for for queer issues about their grades I try to be as transparent as I can and I understand due process eh, eh dapat bibigyan ko rin sila ng due process pakikinggan ko sila kung talaga naman meron may, sila, may punto sila then that's a factor that should be uh, considered in terms of evaluating their, their performance. 
magandang magandang punto yon no at yun ang medyo mahirap talaga for for teachers no because you teach therefore you'll have to model no you know you're like you're always the you're the message uh, every time kaya yun ang talagang malaking challenge no sa mga uh, mga guro sa mga school officials so i uh, uh, at this point we'd like to uh, thank you uh, attorney chel alam namin no uh, merong kapag next na appointment uh, ikaw ay uh, marami yatang children <laughs> na waiting for your you know time and attention but we are very very privileged to have you here at the PAC and of course we had to like coordinate this now with our former chair here at PAC that's brother Armin Luistro when he was the sitting DepEd secretary so on behalf of PAC po maraming maraming salamat of course with our partner Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines na talagang dapat manguna no dito sa direction na to towards ensuring no transformative education justice and peace education you know empowered uh, and engaged citizenship and all that kasama naman ho talaga yan sa mga uh, programa ng ating mga eskwelahan at hopefully no it will really uh, we 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 we, we uh, sow the seeds and that uh, this will all bear fruit you know, for for the the Philippine society for all of us. So, maraming maraming salamat, Attorney Chell. At uh, um, sa susunod siguro, baka pwede mas mahaba. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you and magandang magandang hapon ulit sa inyo. Okay, so uh, we really had to let go no, of uh, Dean Chell no, because of his uh, other commitments. But uh, we'd like to thank no, the, those who supported uh, the PAC in this uh, educational leadership series, Leader 2, which starts today. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, the Catholic Educational Association of the Philippines National Advocacy Commission and uh, Inteligente Publishing, which uh, both cross-posted this webinar. If you go back to the slides on the next two days, we'd like to invite you not to tomorrow at 10 in the morning, we'll be discussing uh, historical revisionism with uh, John Neri, a columnist of Philippine Daily Inquirer and also the chair of the Asian Center for Journalism of Atene de Manila University. And then on Friday, uh, another very interesting uh, topic, now social media as a force for good, uh, Professor Christian Esguera host of ANC Matters of Fact, and also a professor at the University of Santa Tomas. We also would like to acknowledge uh, those who helped us uh, mount this, now from the National Office of PAC, uh, Presi Labao from the Training and Development Unit of, of PAC, Butch Everola, I, our IT and IM officer, uh, Terence Barido, Red Gallego, May De Malanta, and Grace Camesa from our Finance and Admin Unit. So uh, we'd like to thank all of you. At sana makita namin kayo uli bukas at sa uh, Friday no, for the continuation of Leader 2.